Tonight, we have two of the absolute best technicians in the Portland area, Daryl Slack and Stanley Lumapas, to show you what to do to take care of your equipment, and then they will be able to answer your questions. A super quick, shameless plug for our company. Uh, we offer a really exceptional service at rates that are typically 25% below the supply companies. And to learn more about Reach, you can go to reachforservice.com forward slash dental offices. And to give us a try, you can just hit the click here to request service button once you get there. Okay, a little bit about our process tonight. Daryl and Stanley will go through sterilization, lab, the mechanical room, and an operatory showing you tips and hints. If you think of a question after tonight, just send an email to service at reachforservice.com. All right, I think we are ready to go. Daryl and Stanley, take it away. Hi, uh, I'm Daryl, and uh, the man behind the camera is Stanley tonight and we're able to take on any questions as we go along. Um, I'm gonna be going through, uh, as Greg said, uh, the different parts of the office. First, I'd like to start off by thanking Dr. Bletchers and Peters for hosting us tonight uh, and letting us use their office. Um, starting off in sterilization, um, this office has M Midmark M11 sterilizers. Uh, it's, they're very easy to use, very basic. Um, the, main, the maintenance on them is very basic also, very, very crucial, but very basic. One, the most important thing is you want to drain the water and uh, very easy to do. You just drop the hose down. Uh, you want to do that weekly and refill it with distilled water. Um, there is a manufacturer's uh, maintenance program, uh, weekly, daily, weekly, quarterly, but that's definitely the most important is to drain the reservoir weekly and refill it with distilled water. Your door gasket, very easy to, uh, to tell how the age of the gaskets. The, the door gaskets, when you first put them in, are very tight and very snug. As they get older, they shrink. When you, the way you wanna test them is when the door is cool, wiggle it around. The older it is, the looser it is. And that tells you the age of it. Um, and even if it's loose, that doesn't mean you need to replace it. That just means that it's getting older to be aware of it. I always recommend you here keep a door gasket on hand. So if you ever get an error code or a failure, replace the door gasket. If it takes care of it, great. Otherwise, call your service technician. Um, there is, like say, uh, quarterly cleanings of the inside of your chamber. On the statum, statums are pretty basic also uh, in operation. Um, these are Statum 5000. The 5000 indicates the capacity of the cassette, 5000 cubic centimeters. Um, what'll ha what the maintenance is your, your gasket on the top. Um, you want to make sure when this closes, this gasket marries up to the bottom part of your cassette. So what you want to do is periodically check that to make sure that this bottom edge is nice and smooth. There's no buildup or debris. You can use a Scotch-Brite pad if there is and just clean that up. And that's what this gasket marries up to. Um, there are, uh, the gasket's very easy to replace. You can get it, uh, the instructions that come with it are very easy to follow along. Uh, we also offer, offer tip videos, uh, little two to three minute videos that explain that a little bit more in detail with a video if you need to use that. Um, on this particular uh, model, there is a, a biofilter on the back. It's very easy to take out and, and um, check. Uh, so when you, uh, and that's done on um, maybe a quarterly basis. It depends on the usage. It starts off nice and clear and it slowly gets old, uh, discolored on the back here. So that's, a, that's just a maintenance tip that you can easily do. It just pulls off and you replace it with a new filter. Um, that's your statum. Always fill this with distilled water um, only. Uh, good quality distilled water. Uh, this type of sterilizer does not reuse the water. It uses it once and that's it versus the Midmark sterilized autoclaves, they reuse their water. That's why it's so important to make sure you drain that weekly. Um, ultrasonic cleaners. Um, so when you're working on with an ultrasonic cleaner, you to test it, you want to remove the basket, 
You want to fill it up to its regular level. You want to take a, a piece of aluminum foil, not heavy grade, just basic aluminum foil, and take it diagonally from corner to corner and, and put it in there. You can kind of fold it over, close the lid down, and run that for a minimum of five minutes. What that, and then when you take it out, depending on how strong it is, you should be able to get a pattern of different holes in it. Dip, dip, dimple, dimpling uh, on the foil is good, but also uh, the holes in the foil tells you, indicates how strong it is. And they do get weak over time. So that's an easy way to test your uh, ultrasonic cleaners. Assistina, these are uh, handpiece maintenance stations. This is, this is the ADAC brand, Assistina. And very easy to test that out and use. You uh, simply, there's different um, attachments for different type of handpiece, different couplers. Uh, you just click it on with your handpiece in place uh, and you close the door and you, there's a button on the back here. You hold it down for a full count of two seconds and then you release. What you're doing when you're doing that, uh, and this is also a test of operation to make sure everything's working correctly. You, when you push it down, you should see a little puff, leave the door open, you should see a little puff of uh, cleaner come out. And then when you release, you should see another puff of oil come out. And then it should run approximately 30 seconds. It is a mechanical timer on there in there. So it, 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 it goes uh, plus or minus, um, say even 30 seconds, I've seen, but it is easy to adjust that time if it runs on longer. Um, but that's an easy way to test your assets, you know, looking for those, the initial puff when you push down on the button, and then another puff when you let go of the button. And that tells you if the oil and the cleaner are working, okay? So, hydrums. These are, this is a, a Cycan Hydrum instrument washer. This, uh, this particular model has a glass front door, easy to see what's going on. Um, there are spinner arms. There's instruments in this. Let's go ahead and go over this one here. There are Spinner arms, there's three of them uh, location-wise. There's a spinner arm here. What you want to do is you want to make sure that they, they spin freely when you're, when it just fling them around. There's also one on the very top of the chamber and there's one on the bottom. You fling those around. When you, they're easy to take out, they undo just with a turn. You want to check these little ports, make sure that there's no debris in them, and then they just twist right back on. So um, that's a regular, that's a, just a test, a check. And there's also a door gasket all along here. You want to make sure that's in good shape. There's no holes, there's no rips. Make sure that the, the trays slide in and out on these um, nylon uh, uh, glides here. Uh, Hydrums are very susceptible to damage from burrs. So you have to make sure that there's no burrs, loose burrs in there. They do offer a screen down here and also a, a, a fine mesh screen in the bottom to catch those burrs. But, it can really damage uh, the internal components of the hydrum. Um, that's, that's pretty much all you need to do on the, on the hydrum as far as testing it out, the spinner arms, and make sure the door gas is done. There is a maintenance uh, reminder on this. Um, it's so many cycles, and it'll come up on the screen, and that's what you're doing. You're just testing, checking all those components I just talked about, and there's a reset you can go through on the panel. Okay, so that's your... Um, the, your instrument washer. Another item we have underneath the counter here, uh, there's a spout up on top. So um, distilled quality water, uh, you can get a unit, this particular one is called Oasis. Um, this, is, this one in here, this model is done by reverse osmosis, but there's also one done by cartridges from the same company. Um, but you, you have a spout up here uh, to dispense uh, your, your distilled quality water. And you have a monitor down here that tells you the parts per million in um, when it's running. So there's a it's a digital readout, and it just tells you when when it does need maintenance. It's very easy to use. Um, and in the Northwest, we're very fortunate. We start off with pretty good quality water, so uh, they can go for a long period of time. And it takes the uh, uh, the work out of having to haul not having to haul jugs of gallons of water or different ways of uh, bringing up your water supply. That's the uh, extent of the sterilization room. Now we're going to move down the hall to the lab. Hey, Daryl. Uh, yes. Uh, why don't we uh, Why don't we jump to uh, some questions uh, in certainly, certainly. before we uh, uh, before we jump down to the uh, to the lab? And yeah, so that'd be great. Uh, this is uh, This is Greg Beersack. This is the CEO. For those who uh, 
who joined, and we'll make sure that we have an opportunity for you to have any questions that you might have. We've got a, a couple of questions uh, for you here. Um, the first one is, how often should you test your sterilizer? Okay, so your sterilizer, um, you have four tests. Um, and you can do that in-house if you have the, uh, the, the unit, it's an incubator, uh, to test that in-house, or you can send it out. The majority of people just send it out for a third-party test. That's done weekly. Uh, so what, when, what's, what the thing about a spore test, when you're putting it in, in, a, um, in, a, in to run a cycle, is make sure you do it on a normal situation. You put it like an instrument. So you would put it inside of one of your pouches in a statum, the statum, it blows a lot of steam and there's a lot of current going around. So if you just have that little spore test laying by itself in there, it can blow around and stick to the surface and give you a false reading. So you wanna make sure you have it inside of a, a weighted pouch inside your sterilizer. But that should be done weekly. Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, next question, uh, how about uh, documentation? What kind of documentation should be done uh, regarding those those tests? So um, again, um, you should definitely keep a log um, of, of your findings, whether it be uh, if you're doing in-house, you uh, you have the SPORE test, uh, the, uh, the company that you use, or uh, if you're doing a third-party SPORE test, um, then they would also, they would send you that documentation and definitely keep that, uh, any kind of documentation like that for I believe it's a minimum of five years. Okay, great. Last question we have in uh, sterilization. Um, what about the detergent that is used in the hydrum? What, what, do, what do we need to worry about when it comes to checking the, the detergent or how things are working with the detergent in the hydrum? Yeah, so the hydrums are, are pretty smart uh, instrument washer. Inside here are the detergent boxes. Um, they, uh, there's a, um, a flow meter in, in, a component inside that tells you um, if you're actually getting detergent in there. So you don't have to worry about checking the box or anything. It'll tell you if there's a, a low detergent. It'll give you a warning up on the screen here. It is a caustic detergent. So you wanna, you wanna be careful. You, want, you don't wanna get, be uh, handling that and getting any detergent on your hands. Definitely wear gloves when you're handling the detergent. But um, as far as once it's gone through a cycle, it's, uh, it's neutralized. Great, thanks, Darrell. Let's, uh, let's roll on to the next area. I think we're going over to the lab. Sure. Yeah, we'll go down here to the lab. There's a couple of, uh, I, there's a few items here in the lab. And uh, we'll start off with uh, the model trimmer. So one thing that we commonly see in, on model trimmers is the situation of uh, there'll be plaster. We'll walk in here and there'll be plaster on the, on the wheel, okay? That's a very quick indication that it's, you're not getting enough water flow on here. And what's happened is the drain slowly clogs up with uh, little chips of plaster and then the water, when you're using it, the water raises in here because it's not draining well, the wheel kicks it, uh, grabs the water and starts splashing up here. So automatically you turn the water flow down and therefore creating the clogging on the wheel. So if you do, if you're not, if you're getting a lot of splatter out here of water, that's usually an indication of your uh, drain tube um, not draining well. What I always recommend is when you're running every once in a while, um, it could be every, every third use, is when you're running it, Fill, have the water slosh back in the tube, lift your drain tube up if, you're, if it's flexible enough, lift your drain tube up and get that water sloshing down and it'll, it'll flush out a lot of the debris of the tube. But that's usually an indication of your drain tube if this is covered in plaster, okay? Um, another device we have is your plaster trap. And down here, this is called, uh, this, this brand here is an Olsen trap. Uh, uh, it's a three and a half gallon bucket. And it's opaque, so you can, this one is pretty much empty. It does look, uh, it looks full, but it's, that's just liquid in there. But you would see the sediment slowly rising. And then they're very easy to replace. You just pull these flexible lines off of the bucket and you put the new bucket in, you, you slide the uh, hoses right inside the bucket and you're done. So that's pretty easy to replace the plaster trap. Um, that's pretty much the extent on a lab. Of course, every office is gonna be different. Uh, there's a, 
Um, there's a lathe over here. They're very basic. There's really no maintenance on those at all that you need to do. Um, they're pretty much uh, uh, workhorses. Um, hey, Daryl? Again, yes. Uh, before we move on, um, could you share a little bit about the eye wash station there? Certainly, certainly. So this uh, particular eye wash station, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a manual use, meaning it's hooked up to your, your faucet. You always want to make sure that wherever you install an a, um, eye wash station, that you should not have any warmer water capability than 100 degrees, okay? So if someone has an eye situation happen, an emergency, if they were to come in here and turn on the hot water instead of the cold, and they were to pull this and they got any hotter, any higher temperature than 100 degrees, that would not be a good thing. So you wanna make sure wherever you put this, that either the hot water is turned off, so the valve, that valve doesn't work, or make sure that there's, no, there's not a temperature higher than 100 degrees. But you wanna test these weekly, and the way you test them is you turn it on. Now these little, these little things, they, they're loose, they pop off, and they good flushing of the eyes, okay? That, that's all you do to test these. You just run them for every, every week. Should you document the testing of that as well? Yes, any kind of testing you do, um, that's definitely one you want to keep track of because it's, uh, it, you know, if, if for some reason uh, there was a, a question of whether uh, it was ready to go, you would have that documentation that you did do the testing. Oh, uh, how about the, uh, uh, the plaster trap? Um, the, uh, as far as the smell goes, what, what can you do in order to be able to kind of minimize the smell of that? Yeah, so we, we, we run into that question a lot where um, they want us to replace the plaster trap because of the smell. Um, and a lot of times, you know, um, staff members will come by and dump coffee in there or sometimes rinse, uh, even close to a break room, they might rinse out a place. You never want to send anything down there of any kind of food particles or anything like that. But it does grab bacteria from your model trimmer and everything like that. So it will create an odor that may come up. You can take um, a little bit of bleach and just every, occasionally dump it down the drain, and that just kills the bacteria growth that's happening in there. And that is a common problem with plaster traps, that, that odor. So just a, a little bit of bleach will clear that up. Right. I've got one more question. Um, does the water temperature matter for the model trimmer? No. Um, typically, uh, it's always cold water hooked up to it. You're, uh, you're, wherever it's connected, it's a cold water supply. But um, I, I, actually, I've, I've never had it hooked up to anything other than cold water. But um, I don't think it would have any effect. I'm not 100% sure of that. But I've... Um, uh, back when I was grinding the models, uh, we had no issues, and it's a, it, being that it's a solid, um, the plaster, I don't think it would affect it at all. It, it may be a discomfort because you get that little bit of spray on your hands if it was hot water, but you, typically it is cold water. Great. Why don't we uh, head on over to where the amalgam separator is, and I'll right. talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the things that are associated with the mechanical room. Sure. So every office is going to have a different compressor and vacuum system and amalgam separator. So amalgam separator systems are for, uh, it's for heavy deposits, uh, to collect heavy deposits, mainly for collecting amalgam, any kind of mercury, any kind of heavy sediment. And um, it depends on what states you're in, Oregon and Washington require it. Some states aren't required yet, but it's coming about. So. Um, the amalgam separator that this office has is it's uh, the brand name is Solmedics. Here, um, it the the way it works is the pipe, the, all the debris, the liquids and gases from the operatory suction system come in here. This is the holding tank, the upper part, and this is your your heavy debris cartridge. This is a full line, so your cartridge is very this 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 this, this particular brand is very easy to uh, die to uh, check because you can see through the acrylic and see where the sediment level is. They've got another, about an in, a full inch in here. And depending on the office, that could be um, a month, it could be five months. Uh, so depending on how much usage you have. This particular office has uh, um, 11 operatories, so it, that, it, it fills up maybe a little bit quicker than a, a, like a five operatory uh, clinic. Um, very easy to replace. You wanna make sure the vacuum's on when you replace it you would just pull these pins, break the suction loose. You, the, when you order um, a new canister, 
you just put the new canister in, it has a recycling kit that comes with it, and you, re you uh, put the, you know, the, um, the spent cartridge inside that, and you send it back off. It's, they make it very easy. Um, there are a couple different brands, but it's a requirement for a weekly visual check of this. You wanna do, um, on the door here, the, uh, this office has a log that they keep track of every week. Um, they notate uh, how full it is and the person that checks it. Um, this is required and you wanna keep this for a uh, minimum of three years. But um, again, this is fairly easy to change if you need to or uh, your service tech can take care of that. That's your amalgam separator. Um, this particular office has a what they call a dry vac system. There's two different vac vacuum systems. There's a dry vac system and a wet ring system. Um, the, the dry vac system, uh, it doesn't use uh, a lot of water because it doesn't use, it need that for cooling like the wet ring pump. Um, and this, this office has them separated. So the noise and the heat is in a, another mechanical room. That's where the motor is. And that's just gathers, that just creates a suction. All the liquids, are stored in these big tanks here and through the day and they fill up and at the end of the day they dump and then they there's a washout a water washout that washes them out there's um on this there's the, the control is actually right here and this tells you uh like pump two is uh, pump one is a zero and pump two is, a, is at 50 so that tells you all the time it's monitoring the two different pumps we always recommend that you have two pumps two motors that way um, you can alternate them and alternating them every day extending the life of the pumps and also if you ever have one that goes down for any reason then you always have another one that may get you by strong enough to get you by while the other one's um, out for repair or whatever's being done with it um, because that's crucial of course to an office is your vacuum and your compressor so you always want to consider having a two motor system um, these are very reliable. These are very, uh, very good systems to drive that. Their techniques, uh, Mojave drive that system. Um, uh, we won't uh, be going down to the uh, mechanical room. Again, it's just two motors. Um, there's nothing you do on those at all. Uh, the main control is here, and that's monitoring them all the time. We would look here for any uh, concerns. Um, there is, a, uh, there's, and of course, every dental office have, have air compressors. Um, there's different kinds of those also, as far as maintenance. Um, there's, uh, there's desiccant brand uh, models that uh, dry the air. Um, oilless, you definitely wanna, if you don't have an oilless compressor, you wanna consider that because uh, any oil particulates in the air uh, affects your uh, composites um, and failures on your composites. It can cause issues there. Any moisture, of course, if you're trying to dry, you wanna make sure you have that really uh, dry air, and dry clean air, and having a uh, oilless compressor would, um, would provide that. Um, there's uh, maintenance that you need to do on that, uh, depending on the model. Um, some require it annually, uh, changing oils. Uh, if you have an oil compressor or even an oil vacuum system, there, there are systems that are dry vac that have oil heads and you have to have that replaced on an annual basis. Um, compressor, if you do have to have an oil compressor, annual replacement of that um, on your vacuum pump, um, it's, it's checking to make sure everything's okay on that. So uh, if you have um, any, qu any questions on, on the mechanical room itself. So Daryl, maybe uh, one of the questions uh, that people would have is, when it comes to your, uh, your vac lines, um, mm -hmm. What do you recommend as far as maintenance for your vac lines? And then how does that impact uh, your amalgam separation? Right. So um, we always recommend um, a, a line cleaner, a vacuum line cleaner uh, that has a live enzyme. Uh, there are detergents out there. And mainly what the detergents are doing is they are killing uh, any uh, bio growth that's happening in the pipes and so on but it doesn't really clean out the pipes as they go along. Um, the live enzyme cleaners, what they do is it's all natural. Um, they have a live enzyme that goes in there and sets in the pipes and actually eats away at all the bio growth that's going in the pipe. So it keeps them constantly cleaned out. Um, so that, that live enzyme cleaner does that. It clean in your um, operatories, in the solid traps, it looks like a, almost like a brand new, um, 
cleaner in there, a, a trap in there because it's always being cleaned out uh, naturally by those live enzymes. The ones we, we recommend is uh, uh, from Sable. Uh, it's called, the product is called BioPure. It's a really good product. Um, you only want to run it typically uh, twice a week versus the detergent cleaners are recommended every day at every end of the day. With the live enzyme cleaner, they want that live enzyme to stay in the line so that you're only going to be doing that twice a week. And then also there is a liquid if you want to uh, flush out the system after uh, surgery. But so it does a couple of things. It uh, keeps your main line clean. But as I was saying earlier on your amalgam separators, you have to do a visual check on that uh, cartridge. And if you don't, if it is, if your cartridge is really dirty and a lot of bio growth is going there, I've had it where you cannot see how full that cartridge is. So that's another thing. It keeps that clear. But um, in that cartridge, it's it's designed to collect all the heavy sediments. But bio growth happens, and what will happen is that that cartridge fills up even faster with the the bio growth. With the live enzyme cleaner it's eating up that bio growth that's happening in there and sending it down the line. So you're only collecting um, very minimal bio growth and also mainly just the heavy sediments. So that doesn't fill up as quickly and therefore you don't have to change it and the expense of changing it. Okay, Daryl, let's, uh, let's jump on to the, uh, to the operatory. All right. So um, we have uh, in this office, there are, um, we're going to, kind of go over, I'll, I'll first go over the water um, system. Um, that uh, the water systems, we have uh, two uh, different styles. We have um, uh, the two different style water bottles uh, in, in these two end operatories. So uh, in this particular, in this operatory here, it, uh, it's a screw off, it's a quick disconnect water bottle. For one thing, this is a two liter uh, water bottle and they're very, they become, they're heavy and they're awkward to screw on if you have to screw it on. To get, and what happens is you strip the threads out on these water bottles. So um, what this does this, with this adapter is it's a, called a quick connect. You just push it up and quarter turn and it's attached. You don't have to thread it on. Um, that's a very easy one to use. Um, the water, there's, there's different ways that you can um, clean your water lines, uh, keep your water lines clean. This particular office uses a Sterosil straws. Um, this is an annual installation replacement cartridge. And uh, all you do is when every year, it had the Sterosil has a built-in shock, a mild shock that uh, it shocks the line. Um, we do recommend testing it. We'll go into the, the water line testing in a minute. But um, this is in re this would be uh, it replacing any like water tablets that you have to do every time you fill a water bottle. The straws are a great um, um, alternative to that because it's it's once a year maintenance. We do recommend testing your water lines. Um, there is a uh, water line test that we recommend. Um, very easy in house. It's called Quick Pass. Um, by Pro Edge, and very easy to use. Um, you have this uh, vial. You pull the paddle out. Anything that uses water on a water bottle on one water bottle, uh, you have hand pieces, hand piece tubings. You have syringes, air water syringes, and possibly cavitrons. You want to get a little bit of water from each one of those items and fill this up to the, the, the line here, and then you put your paddle in. You lay it face down for a minute. After a minute, you take the paddle out, you dump the water out, you put the paddle back in, and then you put it in a, jar, in a dark drawer for 48 to 72 hours. After 48 to 72 hours, you take it out, and Quick Pass, um, Pro Edge has a nice little graph here that you just uh, read if, whether, how much bio growth, is, biomatters are on your, on your paddle after the 48 to 72 hours the uh, colony units. So it's a pass or fail. And what you do, um, what ProEdge recommends is they recommend quarterly testing of your water lines. Um, after you, with, once you start this, after you get three consecutive passes, then you move uh, monthly passes, 
then you move to your quarterly testing and then, then on out. But you want to make sure you document all your testing. Um, it tells you, it, it asks uh, the date, the person that tested it, the location, what operatory, and what kind of source you got it from, handpiece tubings, um, your air water syringe, the scalers, and so on. The date the results came in, what were the results, and um, what, what you did to, um, if, if it did fail, what, your, what you did to uh, solve that, that problem. And typically, it's just a matter of shocking your lines. There's different shocks you can get um, uh, in the, there's uh, different shocks available that you can use to shock your water line. But Quick Pass is a, a easy to use. They also offer um, a um, annual third party testing that you can do. You can, uh, the, it's a kit that uh, you uh, gather the water samples and you mail it off to them. That way you have a third party testing. Okay, enough on the water line testing water system. Here's a um, patient light, very easy to check and operate. You wanna make sure your safety shield is all uh, clean and also clear of any cracks or this is what a patient looks like, looks at all the time. And a lot of times the operator doesn't see it as much, but this is right in front of the, of course, the patient's mouth. So make sure you uh, keep that clean. And you want, only wanna clean these with uh, uh, like gauze, a, damp, a water dampening uh, gauze. Never use any kind of cleaner. It'll discolor your reflector blends. Um, testing it is by turning on the switch. That switch is moved nice and smoothly. And then you have your uh, intensity switch on the back here. Uh, pretty basic. You wanna check for any drifting. Okay, that can also, that can be adjusted for any drifting up and down to make sure it stays in place. Um, that's your patient light. Uh, patient chairs, um, there's not much you can do with this. They are a low contact area as far as your upholstery. Um, and so it's up, it, manufacturers mainly recommend just a, a mild detergent wipe down uh, if you need to clean it. If you need to disinfect it, if you feel the need to disinfect your upholstery, wipe it down with your disinfectant cloth, but follow it uh, to, by a, uh, a water wipe down. Um, that, uh, that keeps uh, the upholstery from getting hard and cracking. Um, uh, then you can also wrap it. Uh, there's different ways of covering it with plastic. Okay, um, your your cabinetry very basic, very simple. Uh, just checking uh, these kickouts can easily be uh, replaced. Um, all your kickouts, make sure they operate correctly. It, that's just an ease of uh, access when you're when you're needing something out of here when you're working with the op the patient, of course. Very easy to replace those uh, those kickouts. Um, your units, uh, your suction systems, you've got your saliva ejector, very, this is a swivel, okay? It comes off here, okay? You can take this whole unit apart, your, your valve, and take that and put it in your ultrasonic cleaner. When you're done, the, the center part here pops out, you can add, uh, when you're done with the ultrasonic, you can put a little bit of lubricant on those O-rings, and because you're, you're using this all the time and you don't realize how, uh, stiff that may, they, they should move very easily uh, when you're using that. But uh, a little bit of silicone around those O-rings will help out a lot. And that's the same with the high volume suction, HVE, is the swivel comes apart, the valve, uh, the rotor rotation, uh, the core comes out and you can lubricate that there. Um, the uh, air water syringes, always uh, we get a lot of different calls on oh, air water syringes as far as leaks. Um, think of the uh, buttons as an on off valve. If the syringe is not being used, it's sitting there leaking, it's your buttons, okay? Um, they, the buttons can leak around here a little bit um, and also out the end where the tip is, but uh, there's different, different um, problems that can occur and cause, or what, what can cause leaks. But think of the buttons as always an on-off valve. If you're not touching it, they shouldn't, nothing should be happening. If it is, then it, the, the buttons need to be replaced. Tubings, we always check tubings for, for flexibility. Um, th they should be very flexible. You shouldn't be able to hold them out here and the, the tubing stay. Um, you should, that's a lot of resistance when you're using the handpiece if it's real rigid. So make sure that's flexible. It's fairly inexpensive uh, to keep those up to, up to date as far as nice and flexible. They should all be flexible. Depending on the tubing, uh, the expense is different. Uh, this is uh, power optic tubing. They're a little bit more, they're, they're quite a bit more expensive. Um, there's different um, makeup of tubings. There's silicone. There's vinyl tubings, there's different kind. 
but make sure that's uh, really flexible. It, it, for the long term, that's a lot of resistance on your wrist. Um, that's pretty much everything in the operatory, in this operatory. Uh, any questions? Yeah, Daryl, we've got a uh, we've got a handful of questions. Awesome. Um, uh, how about uh, the stool? Um, can you tell a little bit about the adjustments that you can make on a stool, particularly with regard to the um, to the assistance stool? Certainly. Um, over here is a uh, this particular one is an ADAC brand assistance stool. You have your torso support, torso support. So a torso support, it means exactly that. Um, it's very common to have um, people bring the uh, torso support here and put full weight on it. It's not intended for that. Uh, for a right-handed operator and assistant, is it's just supporting your torso so you have something so you can lean over and a little bit of support there. You shouldn't be putting your whole weight on it. This particular one has a lift up mechanism that you can move and bring it in closer. Uh, it has a height adjustment knob here on the side. Uh, if you're a taller, bod taller bodied person, you'd like a little higher, that adjusts like so. Um, and then again, it locks in place as you move it around. Um, the foot ring down here is adjustable. Um, and what it's intended to do is when you're sitting on the stool, you don't want to cut your circulation off on your legs. Um, you don't, you, if you're just dangling them, you can get, cut the circulation off. So that foot ring should be adjusted to your height so your legs are semi-parallel um, to the floor. So you're, getting that, uh, you're not getting your circulation cut off there. And that can be adjusted by different means. It, sometimes they're a, a big knob and sometimes they need a tool. This particular one needs an Allen wrench to adjust that up. Um, that, and then of course your height adjustment is, uh, is depending on where you want to be over the patient and helping in assisting. Great. i uh, got another question. Um, you mentioned uh, lubricant. What kind of lubricant should you use on the, on the uh, saliva ejector and the HVE valves? Yeah, so um, it's, it's recommended that you use a silicone lubricant. Um, different, all the man, dental manufacturers offer it. Um, they, you're, you're using very little for every O-ring, just a little dab. Some of them come in a little uh, uh, plastic uh, tube. Um, some come in a vial. There's different ways you can get it, but um, I would contact your supply house and ask them what kind of uh, sil silicone lubricant you can get because uh, your O-rings are petroleum. And if you're using another petroleum like Vaseline, it's not good for the O-rings. Uh, for longevity, recommend a, a good grade silicone. Okay. Uh, we've got a question for um, the, uh, the headrest. Uh, could you show um, the adjustment of the, the headrest? Yeah, so um, these are underutilized. Uh, they're not used to their, their full intention. This particular headrest is what we call a double articulating headrest. It moves back and forth. If you kind of look at the side profile here, it, it cups the patient's head, okay? So depending on if you're using this for maxillary or mandibular work, you can easily, it's just a quarter turn loosen and then a quarter turn tighten and it's solid, it shouldn't move. If it is moving and you're, you're having to really crank that down, there's components that should be replaced in here to lock, uh, locking components in here. But it should be a simple quarter turn, move it, adjust it height wise, move it up and down to the patient's height and then lock it. Sometimes we'll see a pillow in here that's usually an indication that it's not being utilized. The headrest isn't being utilized to its, its best, uh, best use. Um, and you're trying to compensate for the, the patient's head being back there. If you're using the, if, it's, if it is a double articulated headrest, you should be able to cup, cup, uh, cup the back of the patient's head with that headrest and make it comfortable. And also move that patient so you can easily see the maxillary or mandibular work depending on where you're working. Got another question here. Um, we're considering adding uh, an HVE in hygiene. What are some of the things we need to think about? Yeah, so um, that's of course in the in our, in our latest uh, situation, uh, we're always looking for more suction. Um, you can add other high volume suctions. This particular setup here has one high volume, one saliva ejector. You can add it by add, changing your solids trap and having two ports come out of it. And then you'd have two, the capacity 
to handle two high volume and one saliva ejector. When I say capacity, I say in, the, in your operatory. One thing you have to be aware of is every time you add a high volume, I mean, if you're opening up, up two high volume uh, saliva or two high volume vacuums, it's like adding another operatory, another user. So you need to make sure you have an adequate um, vacuum pump. So what you may be gaining more um, capacity as far as uh, another high volume suction, but your pump may not be able to handle uh, that load. So you need to make sure that your pump capacity is there to handle those extra suction devices that you're adding on, uh, whether it be the in mouth, um, uh, the Leaf or the IsoDry, those different brands, um, they help uh, with the aerosols, they help with the retraction, um, but the suction is there, you're adding more strain on your vacuum pump. So you always wanna make sure you talk to your service technician to make sure your pumps are adequate to handle that. Okay, uh, we've got a question here about um, the air or the, the amount of spray coming out of a handpiece, how do we adjust that amount of spray? Okay, so um, on, your, on your units, your, on your handpieces, you have two controls. You have your water, you have three controls. You have your water control adjustment, you have your chip air or coolant air control, and you have your drive air. Your drive air is gonna be, uh, depending on the user, how, they, how high you like that. Um, and typically that's not creating aerosols. That is actually being, it, it, the drive air goes up to the handpiece, turn, chain, turns the turbine, and then exhausts back in the unit. Um, what you're seeing as, an, as far as an aerosol is when you turn your water on, um, just your water, you would just see a straight stream of water coming out of your handpiece, your high-speed handpiece. What aerosols that is what you call a coolant or chip air, and you adjust that, and that's made to aerosol that water, to make it a mist of a spray, so it hits more areas of your burr or your work surface. Um, if you'd like, you can turn that chip air, coolant air down. Different manufacturers have different, different controls, but all of them have it. And you can just turn that, that coolant air down, therefore uh, creating less aerosol. You are going to have the water come out that has to, you have to have it for cooling the burr, but um, the, turning down that coolant air will create less aerosol. Daryl, could you show where that uh, adjustment is in this, uh, Certainly. in this operatory? On this particular brand, you have, um, you, have all, you have only one coolant air, the chip air adjustment is here, okay? And then you have individual water controls here. Okay, so this is uh, for one hand piece. This is for your other hand piece for water control. There's only one coolant air adjustment here. So what you do is you would turn on um, whatever, how much water you want. Turn first, turn off your coolant air all the way off. Then adjust your water supply on your hand piece where you like it. And then slowly turn up your chip air where it's just adequate where you'd like it or you can leave that off. Like say, it would create less aerosol. Daryl, we've got a, another question. Uh, what are your thoughts around handheld x-rays? Uh, handheld x-rays are, are they're, they're coming more and more uh, in offices that we, we're seeing. Um, they're more, flexi more flexibility as far as um, your one x-ray, uh, handheld x-ray, can, you can go multiple operatories, of course, versus having to have x-ray in every, in every hygiene. Or, um, it, it is a learning curve. Um, to be able to hold that correctly. Uh, so you definitely want to go through some training with your, um, your equipment specialist uh, from whatever supply house you use. But training on that, it's, it's, it's a learning curve on that. Um, the um, technology there is really good uh, as far as it's just like say, it's, getting, it's, it's just a learning curve and getting used to it. Safety is, is there, you have a shield for the operator. You're not getting exposed, especially now with the less radiation that x-rays overall are creating. That's uh, definitely a way that you're able to do that. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, it's, it is a good product. They are, I believe, a slightly higher price than an intraoral wall mounted x-ray. Um, but uh, one x-ray can cover multiple operatories. You do have to be careful of uh, handling them, um, setting them down. Uh, you can drop them easily uh, and, and crack the case. 
Um, so you have to be aware of those kind of uh, hazards of handling that. Um, maintenance also, there's an O-ring. Um, this is a rubber tipless. Some saliva injectors have the rubber tip that hold uh, the tip, the, that hold the tip. These ones actually have an internal O-ring. We go in a lot of offices um, that these just fall out easily. There's an internal O-ring that can easily be replaced in your saliva ejector and also your high volume. Anytime you insert a, any kind of tips, you always wanna do it with a twist and a push. Never just try to pull or push. It, it strains, the, it can rip the O-ring. So just easily just twist it in there. But that can be replaced easily as with the high volume suction as an internal O-ring. Uh, we've got a question. Um, springs around tubing to prevent kinks. Yeah, so there's, um, that's going to be kind of a, um, a septics kind of thing as far as clean, being able to clean around that. Um, tubings have evolved quite a bit. The new, the, uh, the tubings now are very smooth. Uh, there's no creases in them. They're very easy to wipe down. If you're putting it, trying to put a spring on here, um, it can cause a, a lot of areas where it's hard to clean. If you have a good tubing, um, it shouldn't, I mean, if, if it's flexible, um, I know that there are situations where if you're turning, it, it can kink, but typically that's a situation where the tubing needs to be replaced. Um, this particular uh, brand here is Midwest. And this outer part is just a covering of internal tubing inside. They have an internal spring. Uh, this portion here is an internal spring. So that it does support it right here at the base of the handpiece. Um, but again, that's covered by this outer sheath. So the cleaning is, is very easy to do. But um, other springs, if you're trying to add them for, uh, to stop kinking, uh, it'll be, it would be difficult to clean around that. We've got a question about x-ray drift. What are some of the things that, uh, that they should look for as far as x-ray drift? So x-ray drifts um, are very uh, easy to, for a service tech to take care of. Um, it depends on the models you have, but um, uh, as far as your cone length, um, you can have, this is a short cone, you can have a long cone. Uh, that, and that's really your preference as far as what you like to use. But, a co an x-ray should be able to move, and it, the head should be able to move in place. Don't just move it. And you want to move it, stop it, let go, and it should stay in place. Um, if it drifts at all, drifts down, then you need to have your service tech come in and adjust that. That's typically a service technician adjustment. Um, also, you want to make sure uh, that your reach is good and it doesn't drift there. So extend your arm out. If you extend your arm out and it doesn't fall down, like your arm drift here, then you're good. If you do get any drifts of, of, on your x-ray, it's very important to pay attention to where it's drifting at. Um, service technicians are called in on x-ray drifts and, they're, and um, we have to try, it's, it's like a, taking your car to a mechanic. It won't drift when we're there. So if, when you're experiencing a drift, try to pay attention to where it's drifting at. For, for instance, the arm mechanism, the scissor arm here has four different drifting points. This point here, um, it could be drifting here. Uh, this knuckle, this knuckle, this knuckle, or this knuckle, uh, it could be drifting at. So when you're noticing a drift, or if, it, if it's an up and down drift, or even if it's a sideways drift, if it's a sideways drift, it could be drifting here or back of the wall mount itself. So it's very important to pay attention to where the drift is, because even if it's not drifting when we arrive, if you give us that location, we can adjust that drift. Some x-rays, you can't adjust the uh, resistance and it's a little bit more involved in adjusting for drifts. It could be an uh, unlevel mounting on a wall or something. But uh, the newer ones have the, that cap 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 capability of adjusting for uh, different drifts. Another thing that happens is um, disinfectants, it's, it's just a, a part of our lives. Um, and they can um, start chipping away at the plastic and even the paint sometimes. Um, those, those components can be replaced. Um, uh, you can bag them with plastic. Uh, I've seen offices do that. So it's a little bit, a little bit more awkward trying to uh, work around the plastic bag, but that way you don't have to disinfect everything. If you have to disinfect, make sure you're, you're not spraying the area down. 
you want to have a dampened uh, enough, you want to make sure you meet the requirements of, of your uh, disinfectant wipe. But if the more saturated it is, the more uh, corrosive it is as far as on the plastic, because that, that just leaves that much more. You do want to make sure you leave some moisture on there for the set amount of time for that disinfectant to work, but try not to, to oversaturate when you're disinfecting. Um, Daryl, we'll, we'll see if there's any uh, other questions that come in, but while we're waiting, could you share just a little bit about, um, about the ReCare program? You, you've talked a lot about the things that, uh, that offices can do, so lots of really good uh, uh, tips available, uh, the things that offices can do on their own. What's available uh, from REACH uh, on the ReCare program? Right, so we have a, the ReCare program. The reason we call it that is uh, every office knows what ReCare is. So we, we, we talk to our patients about how, the importance of it. So every, our, our REACH program, our ReCare program, is a, our te, us as technicians would come into your office and every six months and we'd go through everything in, an, in your office, every piece of equipment. And that includes drawers, cabinet doors, hinges, uh, we check lights for drift. We check every opera operation, every piece of equipment. Um, we even, uh, if, if we spot something that a patient may be noticing that you may not, um, uh, it could be a loose faucet or a, a little bit chipped paint on a faucet, we, we write everything down on our recommendation list. And we'll do minor maintenance and repairs as we go along on our six month uh, recare. Um, and if it requires, an extensive amount of time to repair something. We'll notate that item and we'll put the time and also the price of a part if we need to order a part. And what we do is we come back and present that to your office. And it, it only takes a little bit of time. It's a free call to come for us to come back and present that. It's a treatment plan for your office is what it is. Um, and you get to choose um, anything remaining. So um, say we, we may point out that your upholstery is cracked or it's very stiff and hard um, and we put down a, what the cost of replacing that upholstery is. Or even your handpiece tubing. It's, we talked about how important it is to have flexible tubing for your wrist and the re resistance on it. Um, we would put notate that. We recommend that tubing be replaced and we would have a price on there how much it'd be. Your slab ejector, your HVE tubing, um, we, we always we buy that in bulk so we can offer it back, uh, the, the savings back to the office is very inexpensive to replace that, um, that tubing. Um, but we notate that all on our recommendation sheet. And when we come back and present that, you get a treatment plan for your office and you can plan out those repairs. You can, you can uh, we'll notice if, uh, um, if a compressor is, isn't sounding right or if there's something wrong or your sterile, sterilizer, uh, if we'll, we'll, we keep track of service records as far as how much you've spent on repairs out of a person, uh, a certain piece of equipment. We, we keep, we're very personal as far as uh, you get a personal technician. Your, the REACH technician is always the same technician that comes to your office all the time. It's not always a different technician. It's always the same technician for that territory. So they get to know your equipment and we can keep track of that as far as, okay, we've spent, a, we've, we've done this, this much work on the sterilizer. It's 10 years old. Uh, you, you may want to start planning for this replacement, even though it's working. It's a, it's a treatment plan as you would do the same thing with your patient's care. Great. Thank you, Daryl. And, and um, is there a contract that is associated with that? Uh, with there isn't. There isn't a contract. All you do to, because, to get onto the ReCare program is schedule six months in advance. And you're it does two things. The ReCare program does two things. It gives you a treatment plan like I talked about, but also we have a three-tier pricing uh, depending on your selection of urgency of, of how urgent you need us to come into your office. Um, when you're on the ReCare program, because we see less service calls within that six-month period, we offer to you that you'll always be locked in at our lowest service price um, no matter what urgency level. So if you have an urgent request, uh, usually that's reserved for a critical piece of equipment like your compressor or your vacuum down. We're going to reschedule our day because we know the urgency, how urgent that is to get us out there and get that up and going as quickly as possible. You won't be 
charged the urgent price, you'll be charged always locked in at our lowest price, no matter what urgency level. We get those, uh, those requests immediately to your technician of your territory and we see the urgency level, we call your office back and we make that appointment as soon as possible. Um, so you, you get those two things on the ReCare program. You get the locked in at the lowest price and also you get that, uh, that treatment plan, the knowledge that your technician is always keeping track of your equipment. Gerald and Stanley, thank you so much for everything that you, uh, that you shared. Thanks so much everybody, have a fantastic evening.